inside the Department of Mathematics at the University of Turin. The laboratory works on visual impairment, motor disability, and developmental learning disorders. This is a photo that we took. And since uh, due to COVID restriction, we couldn't met, we had to work around and uh, do the photo ourselves. <laughs> Uh, as uh, the previous talk, I'm going to talk about um, developmental learning disorders, and here there are some examples to exemplify uh, the, the problems uh, that are dyslexia, dysorthography, dysgraphy, and dyscalculia. And uh, our research focuses on the problem that accessing and memorizing and elaborating written math content can be difficult for students with developmental learning disorders. A common solution is the verbal access uh, used as a compensatory tool to improve the accessibility. There are many compensatory tools to facilitate uh, reading and writing, uh, promote autonomous and independent learning, but scientific, scientific document, and in particular uh, the one containing math content, are inaccessible uh, to test-to-speech softwares. So our work focuses on development and apparatus to enable uh, test-to-speech access to math content, and we also had a user study to investigate the difference between our solution of test-to-speech and uh, um, in, uh, in uh, the effectiveness uh, of the test-to-speech solution uh, for math content. Uh, our apparatus uh, um, consists in different parts. Uh, mainly there is accessibility, that is a LaTeX package uh, that was developed uh, in our laboratory that allows to embed in the PDF documents the corresponding LaTeX code of math content. Uh, we use as a test-to-speech software Epico, that is a, a software created by anesthetists, and it, uh, it uh, enables uh, test-to-speech access to digital content. In our laboratory, we also developed the accessibility dictionary for Epico uh, that uh, enable natural language reading of math content in a different uh, language, English and Italian. Uh, for that, we didn't expect uh, people to know the LaTeX uh, code while reading our uh, experiment. Uh, our user study focused uh, uh, on the question if our apparato, apparatus was improving uh, the um, math accessibility for people with DLD uh, in, with two different questions, an objective feedback. Uh, so we tried to understand analyze the effect of TTS on memorability of math syntax and a subjective feedback. So we try to, uh, to, um, to see the perceived use, usefulness and accessibility of our apparatus compared to reading, of course. Um, in our, um, we had um, 19 participants. Uh, that also was um, a small group um, due to COVID registration. Uh, but uh, our group came from all um, from different university courses and years. Uh, we decided to, to focus our first experiment in uh, only people that uh, doesn't have a math related course in their uh, main topic career. They self reported the different uh, severity of dyslexia and dyscalculia. And they also self-reported um, different um, previous uh, uh, no, uh, knowledge uh, of uh, test-to-speech and math syntax. Uh, in fact, since all the participants were university students with not related uh, course in their main topic, but they could come from a scientific st study in high school, for example. Uh, the experiment was divided in different parts. So first of all, we, we gave them a guide before the experiment to set up Epico in the dictionary. After they came to the laboratory with the preset computer, and we gave them an introduction to explain uh, the, the experiment and also to verify if all the apparatus works. Then we gave them um, two uh, PDFs. Uh, one, they had to access it uh, reading, so with no compensatory tools and one uh, they had to access it with our apparatus. Uh, after each uh, PDF, we gave them a questionnaire uh, to verify uh, the correct um, reading. So in the questionnaire, there was uh, 
uh, two formulae and had to choose among the four providing the option, the correct one. And we also asked them uh, uh, the ease of access and the perceived accessibility on a one to six slide with scale. Uh, so it was done twice. Um, and then uh, at the end of the experiment, uh, we asked them uh, to um, uh, select the preferred condition and to assess uh, the um, usefulness of uh, the bot condition on a one to six Likud scale. Um, our uh, research has the following um, result. Uh, so all the participants, uh, um, for all the participant, uh, test to speech was uh, a good solution. Our approach to test to speech was a good solution, but uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have a significantly um, uh, difference. But um, we decided to go deeper, and uh, we 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 decided to look at uh, um, the result for only the people who decide who stated that uh, they have a low low math expertise. And uh, the test to speech um, uh, result per, uh, was better. And um, for um, instead for the test to speech experience, it doesn't seem to um, to influence the outcome of on memorability syntax. Um, uh, then we decided to also look. Uh, since uh, all the participants were able to recall equally well in both conditions uh, the correct reading, we decided to look at uh, some uh, formula that were more difficult. So we choose the formula with most mirror letters, and those are two formulas uh, that, uh, that we analyze, and we see how the test to speech improve their performance. Uh, as a subjective feedback, we study ease of use, accessibility, and usefulness, and, and uh, all the considered metric uh, um, gave a stark preference uh, to the test to speech access, as well as uh, the per preferred access modality. All but one um, person uh, says that uh, they prefer the test to speech uh, access. So uh, in conclusion, as a subjective feed, uh, the subjective feedback was uh, consistently favorable for the test-to-speech uh, solution uh, we provide for all the considered metrics. And uh, the objective feedback uh, uh, could not be uh, accessed significantly. And that was uh, probably because uh, the formula we choose uh, were too simple for the school level. Um, but uh, a preliminary result encourage uh, a more thorough investigation in this sense. Uh, there are still some limitation uh, to our apparatus uh, due to the one-to-one -one mapping of LaTeX code into the natural language. So as future work for this uh, research, we would like to extend our study to students uh, that have math related course or their topic career study, include the diverse symbol and more complex one, uh, and add additional matrices like the time needed to access the formula and improve the translation, supporting more complex form formula and adding uh, verbal and nonverbal cues. So I would like to thank uh, all of you for your attention and all my collaborators that helped me a lot uh, during. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chiara. Thanks uh, for keeping us well in time. Uh, there's plenty of time for questions. Um, I'm trying to see. whether there's anything in the chat, but just um, put it in the chat or just unmute yourself if you have a question. Um, I'll kick off before, in the, in the meantime, until somebody else asks something. Um, so you had a quite a, a range of uh, people with, with different backgrounds. So those who had some high expertise in, in math syntax, did you see any difference in terms of whether they preferred uh, TDS or whether they preferred something else? Uh, 
the I ones, uh, um, yes, they they were okay with TTS uh, as well. In fact, uh, all the um, all the experiment, but one uh, says that uh, they prefer uh, the TTS access modality. I don't know if I it was the the, the correct answer to your question. <laughs> No, that, yeah, no, no, that, that's, that's, thank you. Yes, that's interesting. Um, that, and, and a follow up to that question is, so often people have been conditioned by whatever teacher they had to, to uh, listen to math or read math in a particular way. Do you, did you find that there's any bias in that respect in your group? Yes, we had, uh as well in uh, some some people that were more used to math to math um, syntax and uh, they um, um, in uh, in the follow up question uh, that we ask uh, about the experiment sometimes they says uh, uh, that uh, um, there are some uh, some words that are said dif differently uh, for example, uh, when you have uh, two um, x um, uh, elevated by two, uh, due to the one-to-one -one mapping, uh, we have to say x uh, um, like on top uh, two or something like that, and it says uh, that is not uh, the correct reading. And right, okay, right, right. I, I, any ideas how you would would um go about uh, removing that bias? I'm sorry, I'm talking uh, the entire time here. I'm, I'm checking with Yes, uh, that is the work uh, that uh, we would like to do uh, by improving the, the dictionary and uh, improving the translation. All right, thank you. I can't see anybody else having a question in the chat, but I might be missing something. I've got too many windows open here. I've got the vulva. That doesn't seem to be anything either. Um, let me also remind you that there's a dedicated Slack channel for session two, S2 Education, in case you want to put any comments in there so we can keep things uh, together topically. Uh, let's thank Chiara again. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Um, and we'll move to the next paper. Hold on. Uh, which is going to be on the use of at car to instill change in the accessibility of university websites. Also a communications paper and it will be given by Silvia Rodriguez Vasquez. Silvia? Yes, I'm here. Hello, Volker. I'm going to share my screen. Can you see my slides? Yes, I can. Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Silvia Rodriguez Vasquez, and I am a research and teaching fellow at the Department of Translation Technology at the University of Geneva. And today I would like to briefly present how a change management model known as ATCAR uh, could be used to understand the type of intervention required to achieve a higher degree of accessibility in web portals uh, of um, higher education institutions. And I will use the case of my university, the University of Geneva um, in Switzerland to illustrate its appropriateness and how it could be applied. Um, so, as you all know well, access to education at all levels is crucial for individuals to be able to develop their full potential, and the United Nations has encouraged state parties since more than 15 years ago to ensure um, uh, that persons with disabilities have uh, access to general tertiary education. Um, however, the literature uh, reveals that the number of students with disabilities accessing uh, higher education is considerably lower than the penetration rate of their non-disabled peers. Um, 
And in this context, actually, the web could help overcome some of the challenges that are often faced by, pe by people uh, with disabilities in primary and secondary education settings, for instance, um, a compulsory physical presence or learning materials in a specific uh, formats uh, and still um, studies keep indicating that accessibility conformance in university websites is rather low um, but why you may wonder well um, making them accessible has been regarded as a particularly challenging task um, because apart from the uh, well-known so social and technical and managerial factors. The fact is that at universities, the variety of content produced is huge. Uh, there is also a wide uh, array of authors that actually generate that content. And also, um, higher education institutions have a very complex organizational structure, and they are because they are often comprised of centers, divisions, departments, and they all have a high degree of freedom. Um, so in that context, uh, why to look into a change management model to actually investigate the topic of web accessibility of university websites? Well, for three main reasons. Um, first, because we have observed some um, the, the stagnation of research approaches used in related studies. If you look into the literature over the last 15 years, uh, we have placed more attention on the final web product, creating the classical technical audits and error reports. But in fact, um, it would be ideal to shift the focus onto individual and organization related factors, its investigation, and actually to propose very more concrete action plans. Um, the second reason is that uh, we have also observed challenges in implementing the web content accessibility guidelines. Uh, prior work um, has highlighted the lack of training and knowledge and time and technical resources as the main reasons for not actually complying to, with these guidelines. But as we have pointed out in the past, it's not only about changing individual practice, but also about changing the institu institutional uh, culture. And in this sense, in this sense um, the ADCAR model can guide change at both levels, both at, at an individual and at, at an institutional level. So it could be a, a good solution. And third, um, the third reason is the particular situation at our university. Um, uh, when it comes to web accessibility. Um, as you may know, in Switzerland, there are different laws and standards um, regulating the development um, of accessible web content, but um, the evidence suggests that uh, best practices are not followed. And in the particular context of the University of Geneva, Although we have been making efforts to become a more inclusive institution, as far as I am aware, um, institutional, institutional accessibility is not clearly regulated and we don't have an accessibility policy informing um, about what's our approach to web accessibility. So let me uh, briefly explain what the ADCAR model is. So when a change has taken place or is going to take place, as in the case of our study, uh, the ADCAR model seeks to uh, examine the extent to which an individual or by extension, the, the institution they belong to is aware of the need for the change. Um, is uh, desire, its desire to participate and support the change, um, the knowledge they have on how to change, the ability to implement the desired skills and behaviors related to the change, and um, uh, the um, whether these individuals receive recognition and they are rewarded at different levels when the change is implemented. So everything related to the reinforcement to sustain the change. 
Um, and the advantages of using this model um, are that it allows for customization. So depending on each team situation, we could uh, look into reinforcement, re um, into a strengthening one of or another element. And by assessing, and second, by assessing each one of the elements, we can define specific methods and tactics to achieve um, each element and obtain actionable steps. So um, we use that. We, we, we said we'll, we'll give it a go. And we use it to measure readiness of um, the staff members generating web content at our institution with regard to the introduction of an accessibility strategy which included an accessibility policy and an associated uh, action plan. And when we did the study, uh, the two documents were still, um, had still a proposal status. So we use ADCAR as a communication and a diagnosis uh, tool. Um, so we launched a, a survey that was sent to all staff members. Um, currently, we have over 4,500 people at the University of Geneva employed, but we don't have reliable data on who and how many of them actually carry out uh, web-related activities. So we sent the call to everyone. It was an online questionnaire available both in English and French, and we described there the change proposed. And in the second part of the questionnaire, we had 18 statements related to the element that respondents um, had to rate on a five point uh, Likert scale, uh, where one was um, strongly disagree and five strongly agree. Um, and the goal was to identify the weakest element, so the one with a score of three or less, to decide what would be the primary focus uh, in the change process. Um, so statements could be, for instance, one related to awareness. I understand the reasons for the introduction of an accessibility strategy at my institution or in a statement related to knowledge. I have the necessary skills to cope with the change. And, and you have the list of all the statements in the paper. So um, we particularly targeted people who would use web development platforms, create content uh, for one or more websites or manage these websites. And we received 86 valid responses, um, quite balanced in terms of gender. And we identified two main groups. Um, one uh, group of respondents corresponded to what we call PAT administrative and technical personnel included the web designers, webmasters, uh, platform administrators. And on the other hand, we had a second group, which were uh, academic staff members, so from assistants to full professors. Um, so uh, the data that we gather revealed that in general terms, uh, we all have a positive, positive attitude towards the proposed change. Um, almost 90% of the respondents seem to be fully aware of the importance of having an accessibility strategy. Uh, but the questionnaire helped us to identify the elements that required more urgent intervention. Um, as, as you can see in the table, the median was higher um, than three in all but two. ADCAR elements, which were desire and reinforcement. Um, and um, let me quote one of the respondents. Um, they said, uh, participant 40, 40 said that accessibility was some, not something new, but um, uh, he had never um, heard the word accessibility in a meeting. So, uh, he claimed that they, there was not uh, management support for this topic. Uh, it was also interesting to note um, that there were specific weakness points uh, observed in, uh, within certain elements. Uh, for instance, participants were quite skeptical um, when it comes to understanding the benefits of that change for them in their work. And uh, if we look at the results by, by group, uh, we observed some differences. And although they were not statistically significant, we could see that academic staff scored lower in all the elements but awareness. And that could be due to the different level of 
expertise uh, in relation to the web. And in fact, this is um, key for us because it could be uh, an important factor to take into account when defining the measures to tackle these ADCAR weakest points. So uh, to conclude, um, despite of the relatively low response rate, uh, this first survey um, helped us to um, validate the, the method and say that we could use ADCAR to develop a more informed and realistic um, web accessibility roadmap and the institution. In fact, we are already designing uh, a short term and long term action calendar with accessibility related milestones like uh, like um, seminars um, and we are considering each division and, and center uh, needs and also very interestingly um, the data has allowed us to identify what uh, we call uh, change agents so that those that score higher in almost all the elements in the model and these could be uh, like leaders when the change will be effective. So in the future, ideally, uh, the model should be relaunched, like reused, so we could re relaunch the questionnaire when the change will happen. It's still in process. And when doing that, uh, we could collect complementary data um, in order to better define the, the type of interventions required. And that's all on my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions. First, my apologies that I didn't spot earlier questions, oh, questions on the earlier talk, because my chat seems to be very slow, but I've now logged in on a second computer to have only the chat running. Um, so if there are any questions, I should be able to actually see them this time. I've seen that, Ted, oh, Sarah, Sarah has a question. Um, what do you expect to be the biggest challenges in ma making the changes? Um, yeah, um, I, I think that the, the, cha the, the, the challenges will be related to the fact that, um, to, to this freedom that we have, like a, almost everyone at our university can ask for um, uh, a website for a project, for instance, and, and they can create their own content. So uh, the fact that we don't have the control of who creates content and when and how um, could be um, could be one of the challenges. Uh, and the second one is related precisely to these different levels of expertise, uh, maybe um, in, in some some I don't know faculties that are more uh, technical, they would be uh, dealing well with the change, while others will struggle more and they will require more support. Um, yeah, so I, I see I see these two main challenges. Well, then we've got a question, or actually two questions by Yelis. Uh, do you think your ADCA results be similar to results from other universities? And do you mm -hmm. have plans to apply this to other organizations? Um, yeah, actually, ADCA is quite flexible. It's been used in other contexts. Uh, um, so uh, yeah, we, we could uh, we, we could use this, um, this uh, model to to investigate the same topic in other organizations and regarding um, if I think that ad card results would be similar. Um, I guess so. I mean, it depends also on the size of the university on how well it's managed. I know that many universities already have an accessibility policy in place. Um, so maybe certain elements in the model will would score higher. Uh, like ability or even reinforcement. Um, so um, I guess it depends on uh, on the expertise or the the background that the university has already in terms of implementing accessibility related uh, policies. Um, Okay, I am thank, checking. Thank you. Uh, and a final question from Ted. Uh, yeah. Were the results rich enough for you to create role specific documentation? 
for instance, the results to create unique approaches for educators, design, leadership, engineers, etc. Yes, yes, uh, that's the, that's the great part. Um, so we collected demographical data uh, as well. So um, we were able to identify the the role and the profile of the respondents, and uh, we uh, we will uh, map. Also, we will try uh, um, use this data to actually um, create a specific documentation for for these roles. We haven't seen if the differences are um, statistically significant, but definitely we have the data. And um, uh, this is one of the main goals of, of ADCAR, to really um, create uh, personalized um, documentation for each one of the profiles um, that create uh, web content. So yeah, it's possible. All right, thank you. Um, and. Following this question now, I take chair's privilege and also ask a final question. In the olden days, everybody had, had their content on their, their home pages, etc. All this content is now moving towards content management systems in mm -hmm. many places, at least. Do you think that will make your work easier? Uh, yeah, definitely. And I think it's part of the accessibility policy that uh, we are proposing uh, actually to, um, uh, to use content management systems uh, that facilitate the implementation of these best practices. Uh, obviously, this is a limitation because we don't have the power to decide on that, but we can inform the uh, people uh, in top management at the university that this could be an um, uh, inflection point and if they use that obviously then uh, certain at least certain best practices could be easily applied but yeah I, I do believe so all right thank you yeah thank you thank you Silva Silvia thank you thank you and let's move to the next talk, um, which is on teaching accessibility as a shared endeavor, building capacity across academic and workplace contexts. And the paper is by Andy Coverdale, Sarah Luthway, and Sarah Horton. And it is one of the candidates for the Best Communication Paper Awards. Um, I've seen all three of the authors uh, in the participants list, so it'll be a surprise who's going to give the paper. Um, whoever it is of you three, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Valka. It's, uh, it's me, I'm uh, Andy Cordell, and uh, it's great to be uh, with you today. I'll just uh, share my slides. So I'm joined today on an ongoing uh, research study out of University of Southampton, funded by UK Research and Innovation. Uh, it's led by Dr. Sarah Luthwaite, uh, with me and Sarah Harton making up the team. And both Sarah and Sarah, as you say, are with us in the session and on Zoom and Slack, and they've got all bases covered anyway. So, uh, so yeah. So our study is focused on promoting educational research and evidence-based practice in computer science education to really build understanding of the teaching and learning of digital accessibility in higher education and in the workplace. And as educators, we, we tend to lean towards social and cultural theories of learning and teaching really, um, which brings us to the focus of this presentation and, and, and our paper. So while we're very much exploring the many aspects of how accessibility is being taught and learned, teaching methods and strategies, etc., our focus today is on how the structural and cultural aspects of computer science disciplines and professional roles underpin and influence accessibility teaching and training practices. In doing so, we identify some of the key differences and also commonalities between academia and the workplace and emphasize the importance of developing dialogue and collaboration between the two sectors. So really developing that sense of a, of a shared purpose and a, and a shared endeavor. 
Our main source of data is our expert panels. So we ran two separate panels with accessibility experts from across the world, uh, one from higher education and the second from uh, workplace settings. Uh, so firstly, conducting individual interviews and then inviting the same panelists to, to comment on, uh, on an online forum uh, to discuss key themes and topics that we generated from our analysis of, of the interviews. Uh, and these comprised of key quotations, some of which you'll see in the following slides. So effectively, the expert panel method validates and extends our data collection around a, a sort of a collaborative space and a, and a shared dialogue. So, so let's get right into the findings, um, identifying these key contextual challenges in accessibility teaching and training that we see limiting how learners can engage with and learn accessibility and also take forward into their workplaces. Um, firstly, and quite fundamentally, experts from both sectors described how they and colleagues are still raising awareness of accessibility um, and seeking to influence and motivate others to embed it in their teaching and training. Um, secondly, disciplinary cultures within computer science education persist in determining how accessibility is both valued and taught, basically. Uh, and, and this is evident in the contrast we see between, you know, human-centered approaches that we, you know, we, we associate with HCI and those more technology-focused fields. And importantly, we saw this perpetuated by corresponding role-based cultures when we get into the workplace. Um, we then have what was described by one of our experts as the hero model. So, so this reliance on individual accessibility heroes or champions. Uh, we see this in the workplace where, um, as Scott Hollier here suggests, people end up being the one go-to person that picked up accessibility as they go and have to put out fires. Um, but there's not that organizational buy-in. In, in academic settings, there was a particular concern over the precarity of accessibility expertise in faculties. And Justin here says, you know, if there's no passion for it, as soon as you turn your back on it for a second, it'll be shut down and fold. And our final challenge points to a, what some believe to re really be a disconnect between ac academia and the workplace. We, we had several industry experts bemoaning the lack of accessibility in university courses, while some academic experts talked of uh, accessibility knowledge and skills being margin marginalized once their students get into industry. And this was described by several experts as a, as a, as a chicken and egg problem. So, and so now we look at how our experts are responding to these challenges and, and developing accessibility to, towards a sense of a, of a shared endeavor. Fundamentally, firstly, by promoting accessibility as a core value and competency uh, across roles and disciplines and embedding accessibility in courses and curricula uh, and training programs. One way of challenging the, the hero model is to cultivate centers of excellence um, where accessibility, accessibility experts can engage with like-minded colleagues, uh, and also importantly, user groups and other stakeholders in, in accessibility. As uh, Anna Lou Waller explains here, it's embedded in everything we do. It's part of our culture within computing in Dundee. From day one, we as academics have seen accessibility as core to all our teaching. We also see a move to professionalizing accessibility. So 
seeing a shift from those moral and altruistic views of accessibility to that of a of a professional responsibility. And uh, Amini puts it quite bluntly here. Uh, that's their job. That's their responsibility to make it right. That's not something to have good conscience or karma points. It was also interesting to hear our workplace experts, um, how they address role-based training. Some stress the need to teach specific roles, uh, particularly when content and tasks are uh, uh, highly specialized and, uh, and advanced. Uh, but others discuss the advantage of bringing people from different roles and specialisms together. Uh, and adapting their training to different organizational structures. Um, and as Billy from Ubisoft here explains, if possible, we love to mix the roles uh, and get QA, design and development all in the room at the same time. So they understand what their individual responsibilities are and how they overlap and how they work together. And I think most experts agreed on the need for effective communication between roles, identifying how accessibility tasks and responsibilities are shared across roles and, and delegated within specific um, workflows, I guess, you know, in organizational structures. And, and just a couple of final points. We, we're certainly seeing how academics are establishing direct links with industry through developing real world assignment briefs and, and client based projects. We see it in internships and work programs, and also inviting industry experts in to, to do de uh, guest lectures. And, and finally, we also know. Historically, the technology profession has engaged in informal and self-directed learning. We, we see this in online forums and uh, boot camps and hackathons, etc. And several of our experts discussed um, how best to harness these and, in, and, and, if you like, integrate them into their more formal teaching and training programs. So, summing up. Um, we are certainly continuing in our research to help develop uh, connections and dialogue across academic and workplace sectors to really build understanding of, of, uh, of teaching and pedagogic knowledge, uh, promoting champions networks and other communities of practice that support teachers, learners, practitioners and user groups around accessibility. Um, looking particularly at how interdisciplinary and cross-role learning develops, I think, criticality and, and increasing, increasing that understanding of some of those ethical and social aspects of accessibility. And certainly engaging in, you know, diverse perspectives and insights from, from different learning contexts. So I hope that was useful. Uh, do please have a look at our paper where you can find lots more quotes from our expert panels. Uh, our website and email are there um, and we welcome any comments or questions. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, are there any questions? Again, I shall check my chat on the other computer. Um, oh, Sarah has a, has a comment or a commercial rather. We have a call for papers inviting submissions on the teaching and learning of accessibility. Please do considering making a submission. That, that is a good idea. Everybody who does teach some uh, accessibility in in their curriculum, that sounds like a great plan. Um, um, while maybe people are typing the questions, I'll put a, a reviewer question we have we have here from from one of the reviewers, obviously anon anonymous, um, to to Andy. Is there a need to develop a digital accessibility knowledge framework to support the development of digital digital accessibility competences? 
Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, I mean, we, we've obviously got lots more of the projects still to run and uh, we're looking at different types of outputs that we can develop. And uh, I think one of them is certainly a, a framework that would be of practical use to teachers and those supporting accessibilities where you can come into it at different levels really and we we, we have this uh, we're developing this framework where you know we're looking at accessibility from very much a task level to more of a strategic level and then that sort of overarching view so sort of three or four different levels where depending on your role and where you you're coming into you know to developing accessibility you can um you know, we, we can support that from our findings and develop a framework where we can uh, disseminate our findings in a, in a really practical way and in a framework that is useful for teachers and for, for everyone supporting uh, accessibility at an institutional level, whether it be in a, in a higher education institution or in a, in a workplace setting. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have a question which is not necessarily related to the paper, but it's Southampton. I assume you do some accessibility teaching. Um, how do you actually do that there? Well, I don't. I mean, my background is, um, is education and, um, you know, I'm coming at this from an educational perspective. Sarah and Sarah have more, um, certainly they have more um, experience in this particularly Sarah Harton but um yeah so I'm happy for them to chip in if they wanted to uh to, to join in here um so I'll, I'll chip in um so at Southampton we, we traditionally have had very strong sort of accessibility teaching led by Professor Mike Wold so it's it's been here for many years and that's one of the great things about being based here is our sort of closeness with computer science but I suppose what makes our project unusual is that we're based in an education department we're not based from within computer science so we're very much reliant on uh, I suppose using our educational frameworks and lenses on pedagogy but making the most of our expert contributions and in that sense it's sort of finding that alongside her, as they might say in social science perspectives as also drawing in insider and outsider perspectives through the teams. So we're fortunate that we have quite a mix um, of perspectives, but I think maybe being outside the technical disciplines and in education hopefully means we bring something slightly different to uh, this, this kind of space. But of course, we're always open to collaboration. All right, thank you very much for that answer. Um, are there any, I, I can see some action in the chat, hold on. Uh, thanks for sharing your findings and yes, all right. So every, everybody's happy about that. Um, I think we have, we have a minute, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just, just take my chair's privilege again because we, we, I've started teaching at Birmingham accessibility for the first time. In a, in, a, in a team project this year. Um, um, so everybody has to do it all the second years. And uh, I did a hands-on exercise in a lab class where I had the computer officers remove all the mice beforehand. And then I asked the students to log in, which of course, everybody was very puzzled. And best thing was that quite a number of students started rebooting the computer as if that would bring the mouse back. Now, this is a, a mental parry, I think, towards accessibility already there, which all computer scientists have. Anyway, so that was just an anecdote I thought I'd, it was worth sharing because it was just a hilarious thing. Um, all right, um, but I'm, I'm afraid we have to move on. Thank you very much. Again, this was a, a candidate for the best communication papers, and they will be announced tomorrow at the end of the conference at this closing session, as usual. Um, right, so the final paper is actually a technical paper, and it is, hold on, I'm trying to find it here, it is called For One or For All, Survey of Educator Perceptions of Web Speech Auditory Description in Science Interactives. 
And the paper is by Brett Fiedler, Dalesian Smith, Jesse Greenberg, and Emily Moore. And um, who's giving the paper? Uh, it would be me. Hello. All right. Thank you. Um, I, we can see your slides. Please go ahead. Awesome. All right. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Brett Fiddler. I work with the FET Interactive Simulations Project as an inclusive STEM education researcher at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, the title of this presentation is For One or For All, Survey of Educator Perceptions of Web Speech-Based Auditory Description in Science Interactives. And I'll give a truncated overview of our paper that shares the same title, but I highly encourage you to look it over for more detail. Uh, modern web APIs uh, do enable rapid and scalable development of auditory display features, uh, such as web audio for sounds and sonifications, and web speech for speech input and output. Um, the web, web speech API in particular, while of course not the same as a screen reader software, is capable of some text-to-speech and auditory description display features that are traditionally provided via screen reader software that can access true text on screen or made available in accessible digital media. So to us, this opens up uh, opportunities for a deeper understanding of, of how and for whom auditory descriptions can benefit. Uh, our context for description is the FET Interactive Science Simulations, which are free open source learning tools designed to be highly interactive, intuitive, and provide real-time feedback for science concepts, uh, include multiple conceptual representations, and implicitly scaffold inquiry in which users engage a cycle of exploration and discovery toward scientific reasoning, all of which impacts the auditory description design. Uh, here, there's an image of a FET simulation, John Travoltage. A uh, grayscale character is positioned, pointing towards the door while standing on a carpet. A cursor is poised to drag his left foot forward and backward, while large blue electrons flow from his foot to his finger, discharging into the doorknob. Uh, auditory description display for digital resources has progressed across a continuum of visual and interactive contexts with increasing interactivity from static graphics through to dynamic graphics, uh, games of varying complexity, and onward towards AR and VR experiences. Uh, interactive simulations generally fall somewhere before most games in terms of scope, interactivity, and graphical complexity. And work began in 2014 to develop a description design framework for interactive simulations compatible with screen reader software, which is now published. So this description design framework uh, led to the development of the Parallel DOM uh, and ultimately our interactive description feature uh, in which the simulation hierarchy is broken into on one side, navigable and browsable state information that update as the learner makes changes. Uh, and on the other, interactive responses that alert the learner to relevant changes triggered, uh, yeah, uh, triggered by uh, the interactions. This framework allows learners to build their own story about what is happening in the simulation, not visually, towards sense making of the simulation learning goals. Uh, I'm sorry, while I'm at it, I'll also provide a link there in the chat to the, the PDF of the slides. So using that framework as a starting point and through inclusive design probes with diverse learners, we designed and developed a customizable web speech based auditory description delivery system coined voicing for two interactive dissimulations already outfitted with interactive description for screen readers. Uh, the voicing feature is intended to be optional and customizable to voice simulation information only through intentional interaction, regardless of input method. Uh, and to complement other feedback modalities, uh, whether that be visuals or non-speech sound. The images on the right show the menu options for adjusting the type and amount of content read during interaction, uh, similar to the responsive alerts on the prior slide, as well as a toolbar to turn voicing on and off, uh, or press buttons to play important information about the current state of the simulations at any time. So rather than detailing all the nuances of uh, the voicing feature, which I encourage you to read the paper for, uh, let me take advantage of our presentation format here to show you the voicing in, uh, in action uh, for two of the simulations we uh, included in the survey. So I'm gonna do tabs to this, and I'm going to uh, change the sharing to optimize for video clip and sound. And then here we have our simulation, John Travoltage. 
if I navigate down to the preferences menu and the audio tab, uh, I can in voicing it, on. It says voicing on. Uh, and through this menu, you can change the types and kinds of information that you want read out to you while you interact. Uh, so, for instance, without anything uh, put on whatsoever, I could come in and arm swing. Uh, click on the interaction. So there you can click on the arm to swing the arm. Leg swing. You could do the same for the leg. So those are the two interactive parts. Uh, but nothing else would be voiced as I move around. Preferences, I audio go, tab. I could go back in and turn on. Voicing surrounding context changes. Something like the context changes, which is voicing information about things happening that aren't the thing that you're controlling, um, such as. Leg swing. Several electrons on body. Indicating that electrons are uh, entering the body, uh, even though that's not the action that you're taking. Uh, <clears throat> so these Preferences, all, these audio all, tab. Sorry. These all control uh, the different interactive alerts that you can uh, experience. Uh, and we can change this uh, per learner, uh, however they want to. There's also on the uh, uh, within the tab the ability customize to- Customize voice, custom, expanded. Customize the voice uh, using any system voices. Uh, adjusting the pitch and the rate as well. I'll leave it a little slower for the actions. Uh, on the left side, we have the on-demand descriptions. Uh, so uh, uh, descriptions that are updated as the state of the simulation changes. So if I were to press the details right now, you would hear. John has several electrons on his body. John has hand close to doorknob, and he is ready to swing his leg to rub his foot on the rug. And Preferences, then, audio tab. With my surrounding context changes on, if I move John's arm towards the doorknob now that he has some electrons on him. Arm swing. Several electrons discharged with hand at doorknob. Okay, and I'm going to pop over to another one, which is a slightly different interaction scheme. Um, and in this case, I'll actually use the keyboard instead, uh, instead of the mouse. Sim voicing. So here I have a different voice on, um, but we can navigate through tab focus. Quick info. Uh, Play overview. Reading any uh, reading blocks that are on the screen. This one has uh, reading, uh, uh, which got on screen text, whereas the other one did not. Um, but we can listen to an overview, for instance. Gravity Force Lab Basics is an interactive sim. It changes as you play with it. There are two mass spheres, a blue sphere labeled mass one and a red sphere labeled mass two. A force arrow starts at the center of each sphere and points directly at the opposite sphere. And I'll stop right there. Uh, and you can continue through this, moving the sim Four around. kilometers from mass two, move mass one. And communicate uh, information about the thing that you're focusing, if that's what you want, or you can turn that off or uh, receive information about what's changing. 4.5 kilometers from mass two, farther away, force arrows get smaller. Force is now 26.4 newtons. Uh, so I'll bring this back. Uh, and these are, again, in the PDF. Uh, feel free to uh, take a look at them uh, yourself. If you use a screen reader, uh, please uh, take note of the, the notes within the slide on, on how to access it uh, and not interfere with your screen reader. OK. So here, uh, for the study, we focus on a pair of surveys with teachers and educators who were chosen for their unique perspectives on using the simulations and their pedagogical needs and their students' needs. So we begin an investigation into the following questions. Do educators perceive the voicing feature as beneficial? And if so, what populations of learners do they identify to be likely uh, to likely benefit from a voicing feature? How does that preference uh, change with the amount of voicing pres presented? Uh, and how does it change based on the interaction design of the simulation? Yeah, sorry. We distributed two surveys to educators with one embedded simulation per survey, one with John Travoltage, uh, one with Gravity Force Lab Basics, which you saw. Uh, each survey had over 1,000 respondents. Uh, each survey was split, uh, split participants into three groups with different preset speech output levels, uh, which we use as a proxy for the type slash amount of a text read aloud, with either one, all of the alerts enabled, uh, two, only alerts about changes outside of their input focus, uh, and three, only object names and on-screen text, so none of the boxes checked. 
Responses were tasked primarily with rating Likert style statements related to affect, perceived performance, and experience. Uh, uh, with statements such as it was uh, overwhelming to hear text read aloud while interacting, or I wanted more text to be read aloud after interacting. All the statements are in the paper. Uh, here we focus on the results from two survey elements, the descriptive uh, and statistical analysis of 14 statements about the kind and amount of information, and three statements on voicing benefit and desirability, as well as qualitative look at uh, 509 open text responses to please share any additional comments you have. Uh, which brings us to our first question about uh, learner benefits. Uh, the good news is that more than 60% of educators found the voicing feature desirable and beneficial, both broadly and for specific populations for uh, all survey groups. As shown here, three distributions for my students would benefit from using FET Sims with the voicing feature, uh, and all st students would benefit from uh, with using FET Sims with the voicing feature, as well as the voicing feature should be added to as many FET Sims as possible. Um, all with uh, modes at somewhat agree, uh, so four, and a uh, high frequency for strongly agree, rated at five. I have a quote from an educator here that reads, this has lots of useful potential. As long as there is the ability to turn this feature on and off, it will not be too overwhelming. Interestingly, there's also a difference between my students and all students, uh, with all students consistently rated lower, something to unpack. Educators noted the role of voicing in conceptual scaffolding with both positive and negative sentiments, positively identifying it as supporting initial interaction and exploration, but possibly removing student agency from discovering and reasoning through the scientific content themselves. Uh, one educator writes, I suggest it be limited or controlled by the teacher if possible, so that the uh, conclusions are not readily available for those who are discovering by inquiry. Interestingly, uh, this represents a mismatch in expectations and a design challenge for us, as we design voicing to relay important information about the simulation state, but not as a conceptual guide, uh, such as a teacher might be. Educators frequently referenced voicing as a helpful focus tool broken down into about three groups, uh, as a conceptual go back or look back, uh, or presenting introductory language for learners uncomfortable with the topic a way to slow down or diversify the content for indiv individuals who vary in their visual or auditory processing or executive function, uh, such as those with uh, ADHD, uh, a way to encourage interaction and tension for the general population by activating another non-visual sense. One ed educator writes, I think the voicing feature highlights to all hearing students uh, important details that they could miss. The voice only comes on when something important is happening. It's worth noting uh, our international pool, a participant pool frequently brought up the fact that voicing was only available in English. Some viewed this positively as a way to support English language learners or non-English readers, assuming the vocal parameters were set in a way to be understood, uh, while others indicated that it was not helpful for learners in non-English speaking countries. Uh, one educator writes, it'll be helpful with uh, help people with visual difficulty, but only to English speakers, my students speak Spanish. This provides a future design effort for a tool to translate the voicing strings, something that already exists for the visually displayed text on the SIM. Uh, some educators did not uh, uh, that, that found that the voicing feature excludes learners uh, who are deaf or hard of hearing and learners in contextual situations where it is difficult or impossible to play audio, like in a large classroom setting. They are also uh, frequently me mentioned a complementary feature uh, to display voice text on screen using something like captions, uh, which we hope to accomplish as a part of future research and design efforts with uh, hopefully with scalable web tech as well. Um, our second question uh, to this question, we uh, for uh, whether voicing changed based on the interaction uh, uh, on the amount of, of sorry, uh, with the amount of voicing presented, there we go. Uh, we did not find compelling consistent evidence and ratings between output level presets or comments about uh, the amount of spoken description, but the data did provide some leads. Uh, we suspect the moderate differences and neutral ratings may arise from the fact that the voicing is optional and participants may view it as for an audience other than themselves, um, or that any voicing at all may play more of an important role than the actual amount of voicing. Uh, when results were significant, they tended to favor agreement towards less text when comparing between the all in interactive alerts enabled and the uh, only names and on screen text. Um, keep going here. For our third question, um, whether voicing changed based on the interactive interaction design of the simulation. Um, 
So this question, there's actually a really exciting discussion for another time about interaction design patterns for different simulations. But in brief, uh, we determined that timing and behavior of the voicing during complex interactions may actually affect uh, feature desirability and perception uh, or perception. Qualitatively, participants indicated a misalignment in expectation for interaction and feedback. So what they were doing and what they were hearing, uh, what, uh, which this quote communicates nicely, I think. The, the main problem I noticed was the overlap of sentences. I can predict students would get distracted by that. However, I think that's more of an issue for Travoltage because of the very dynamic uh, situation. Statistically, participants who experienced Gravity Force Lab Basics rated it higher than John Travoltage with respect to benefit to students and overall desire for voicing in FET sims, uh, though again, it was generally positive uh, for all. So to summarize, uh, we found general approval of the optional feature for teaching and learning and less, uh, less statistically extreme than we expected, less polarizing across the preset voicing detail levels. Uh, um, we did not find evidence that the participants perceived the tool as uh, strictly designed for a single group of learners, um, you know, such as uh, only those with visual impairments, and quite the contrary. Um, and we didn't identify some variance in the perceptions of the uh, feature based on different aspects of the interactive design of the simulation, which we think poses some pretty exciting future research opportunities uh, for those designing similar voicing features in interactive media. Uh, just one more. Uh, uh, and, and just a few of the next steps for us. Uh, we've already applied much of what we have learned uh, to these sims and other sims that are in development. Um, we hope to improve the voicing design process by better understanding the diverse range of input methods used with this feature. Um, by contrast, interactive description focuses mainly on discrete input methods like keyboard and mobile gesture. Um, as we learn more about the feature and the design process, we hope to share some guidelines for web-based voicing. Um, and we are also, uh, exploring more contexts where a voicing feature can support learning, such as uh, coupling it with tangibles um, or haptic feedback or embodied experiences. And with that, uh, thank you so much for this opportunity and uh, I'll take any questions and or feel free to reach out um, to any of us on, on this paper. Yes, th thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, my my one Zoom doesn't like to unmute anymore. Let me. <laughs> so there was a clarification question by uh, Yelis. So you do use the speech synthesis API, is that correct? Uh, web speech. Uh, so if you type in web speech API, it comes up with the from the Mo Mozilla. Docs, that was like Google Mozilla Club. Right. So there's no need for yeah. um, actually having a screen reader running. No, this, so this should just work. Uh, you load it up in any any modern web browser and it should work right out the box. Provided uh, the web browser has uh, speeches, uh, has voices, right? Yeah, so, so long as your your device has access to some some voices. Right. So. Uh, which is a great uh, uh, one of the issues that I didn't bring up here uh, that is in the paper is uh, one of the common criticisms was the the tone of the uh, sort of the robotic nature of the voice, uh, which um, you know was due to the fact that it's it's whatever uh, voice is available on their device, uh, and it actually wasn't up to us what that was. <laughs> right. I, so our experience is that Firefox voices are horrible. <laughs> Edge voices are nice. Brave doesn't have any voices. Anyway, so it, it is a bit browser dependent. Any other questions, please? I'll say if not, uh, please, please go check them out. Um, Links are there. All the sims are are free. We'd love to get people's thoughts. Well, th then then I'll ask a uh, a question about your simulations. I mean, I've I've seen John often now. Um, do you have any other simulations you experiment with? <laughs> I've seen John a lot. Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. So John represents a a a simple interaction case while also being dynamic, which makes it a, a very nice test case. 
Uh, for, for voicing specifically, we have um, a friction simulation that will be published soon. We are currently working on two simulations that front sort of the embodied experience of uh, sort of uh, having uh, a, a motion centric uh, interaction that uh, is tied to a mathematic concept. So one that's tied to ratios and proportion, uh, as well as one that's tied to uh, quadrilateral shapes and transform transforming between different quadrilaterals. Um, that is uh, ideally going to be brought out of the virtual screen as well. Um, that uh, will be compatible with voicing. Um, so yeah, we have we have lots of uh, sort of different features available uh, that different simulations are are out there for. I I I remember you had the one with the balloon. I think is that right? Yeah, with the statics that. going over. How would you voice that? Uh, it is for, for those is, who are not familiar with it, two balloons, I think, and you rub things on it, and then you get electricity. Or I'm not a physicist. It's you know. Yeah, awesome that, that shares people. shares a lot in common with John Travoltage in that it, you're exposing sort of the um, the charge, the the uh, electric, those microscopic electric uh, pieces, um, and it shares uh, a bit with that um, sort of more dynamic movement as well in having to describe the uh, location of the balloons, because there can be two, uh, with the relation to the sweater uh, and the wall and uh, amounts of charge that build up and the dynamic forces that are exerted. Um, our, our wonderfully talented Talison Smith has actually already um, described that through interactive description. So it's screen reader accessible now as of, uh, I think, two months ago. Um, <clears throat> so if you'd like to see how that is described, uh, it's, it's there. Um, and we'll be working on figuring out how to adapt that to voicing, um, because uh, I think that the biggest thing that we've learned out of this and that that I can share is that uh, while we've come up with a framework for the screen reader uh, in accessible interactive description, um, it is it is not identical. It's, it's not a copy paste situation to have screen reader compatible descriptions and uh, the case of, of voicing where you can interact with a mouse or a touch screen or um, or keyboard and mouse. Um, so we're trying to have these more general, um, broad input methods uh, is is a fascinating design challenge. Well, great. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions? I can't see any in the chat, which doesn't necessarily mean that I haven't missed any, but I think so. Well, I would like to thank uh, the speaker as well as all the speaker in the session. Um, and um, I think it's now time for a break. Before we go in the break, I would like to say, because in the very early morning session, it was said uh, that it's a shame that we're not meeting up in, in person in Lyon, um, which is indeed a shame, but I've moved to Lyon last year, and I can tell you looking out the window, the weather is miserable at the moment, so you're not missing very much. So hopefully you'll come here one day when it's a lot nicer than uh, this month. Um, otherwise, would like any of the chair making an announcement regarding um, uh, the, the remainder of the schedule for today? Uh, thank you so much, okay. Volker. We are now going to have a meal break of an hour and a half. And after that, we will come back here for our third session, which would actually be our accessibility challenge. See you then.